good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, wherever you're watching this. Um, my name is Adam Thorwell. Um, I'm a novelist and essayist, and I'm delighted to uh, be in some way uh, shepherding this conversation with Margaret Joel Costa, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, and Amanata Fauna um, called Remembering Javier Marias, uh, uh, one of the most brilliant and novelists of recent times. Um, and really, we just wanted, I think, to have a conversation to remember him and to remember his work and to uh, think about what made him, I think, so original as a writer and so exciting to read. Um, I first was in contact with Javier um, in 2012 when I was doing a mad translations project and I asked him if he wanted to be part of it. And I'd been reading him for probably a decade before that. And the first novel I think I read was All Souls, this extraordinary, crazy, apparently Oxford novel, but in fact, I think something much darker and much um, cleverer than that. Um, and we began a very charming correspondence. One of the things I always loved about him was how much he was not electronic. So everything was kind of emailed to you by his um, assistant. Um, so you would get these kind of typewritten letters um, that were kind of emailed personally. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, because it was sort of, I feel like the way I engage with him is, you know, in the way he writes is always this play with the personal. And so I was just wondering if I could ask everyone to kind of think about when they first read him, met him. Um, and maybe I should begin with you, Margaret, as uh, is one of his kind of long-standing translators. Well, yes, I mean, I was, I started with All Souls. That was the first novel by him I translated. And I just, I one day had a letter in the days before email um, from Guido Waldman at Harville saying, would I like to translate a book by a Spanish author called Javier Marias? And I'd never heard of him which is a bit embarrassing, but I, I said yes. I said yes to everything then. And I just thought, I just love, I just loved it immediately. It was so, it was difficult in a way, but there was something about, I mean, I know, I mean, Ada would like to talk about the long sentences, but it's actually the long sentences I love. Yeah. Which is so, I dislike short sentences, which seems to be more of a, a fashion now, I don't know. But the long sentence gives you lots of time gives the author lots of time to explore an idea, and which is what Javier does all the time in all his novels, which is what makes him so um, enthralling, I think. Absolutely. Was he, um, I'm just thinking, this is actually jumping way ahead, so we'll come back to this, but did was he one of those writers who wants to work very closely with the translator? Because of course he did speak perfect English, mm. or did he let you um, do everything on your own with total authority? Well, no, the, the, the translation of All Souls, he wanted to see the entire translation, which was, you know, fairly terrifying, um, knowing that he knows English very well. And he went through it line by line, making all kinds of... Co I found that I came across the, the letter recently, actually, and he came in every now and then, he said, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, but at the end, he said, it is your translation. You are the translator, so it's up to you. Yeah. After that, he never... He never um, did that again, presumably because he didn't have time or because he trusted me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Amanata, um, what about you? When did you first read him? Um, I never met Javier Marias, but I first read him. Interestingly, uh, it wasn't a novel. It was a short piece of nonfiction in Granta magazine. And it was a piece that he had written about his dislike of flying. I know he was always very careful to say he didn't have a fear of flying, but his dislike of flying. And he, in the piece, he talks about how if aircraft were named, uh, the flyer would have a different relationship with the aircraft. Um, yeah. But also he came up with the idea in the piece mm -hmm. of psychological flying, that each time we sit in a plane, especially if you are or have ever had a, 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 a nervousness around flying. I fly a huge amount and always have flown a huge amount. And I remember going through a period where I suddenly became mortal, right? It suddenly <laughs> became possible for this thing to crash with me on it. Uh, and up until that point in my life, this was the sort of, this was, would never have happened to me. And his description of psychological flying, which is that you know, everybody in the aircraft is joined with the pilot in this endeavor, which is 
is to get the plane in the air, fly it through the air and land it safely. And, you know, we watch very carefully every tip of the wing, every um, little bit of turbulence. We watch the the uh, stewards and stewardesses as they go about their business for any hint that there might be a disaster. Uh, so actually, it, it was this piece... And I didn't know who Javier Marias was either. And then either very shortly after that, or around that time, I think I must have looked him up because I came across A Heart So White, which had won the Dublin MPAC Award. And I think that's where a lot of English speakers come across Javier Marias for the first time. And I read A Heart So White and I was so entranced by it that I, um, uh, not only do I now own a heart so white in every single possible um, uh, um, form. I've even got a signed first edition of it, uh, but actually I should get it off my shelf to show you. But, um, you know, I began to read his other works as well at that point. Yeah. And Juan Gabriel, what about you? Well, I met Javier over fax, which is quite a metaphor of his rejection of technology. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are at least a couple of people watching us that have never seen a fax machine in their lives. Um, so uh, so it seems to me very interesting that this is how it happened. I had arrived in Barcelona in 99 um, as an aspiring writer. I had discovered his work a year before and I was uh, absolutely fascinated by A Heart So White and uh, Tomorrow in the Battle, Think of Me. And then I read, uh, all souls um and uh, it was probably around that time that uh the dark back of time is that a translation margaret yeah 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 um, was published so i had already become fascinated with the work of javier marias i thought it was one of the greatest discoveries that i had made as a reader in spanish literature and when i arrived in barcelona the first thing i did was um look for a job. I found a job editing this magazine called Lateral that has since disappeared. Uh, and as an editor in Lateral, I suggested immediately, why don't I interview Javier Marias? They thought this was a great idea, only he lived in Madrid. Um, so we had to do, the, to do it over fax. And this is how a correspondence began that then turned into a friendship um, and I used to have, for a very long time, I had a fax machine in my house only to oh. keep in touch <laughs> with yeah. Javier Marias. This was the yes. only <laughs> person in the world who wrote faxes to me. Uh, and the way, the way that happened was that I would write a letter to him, leaving enough room in the margins for him to answer, to get into a sort of dialogue with my letter in the margins of it. Um, he would comment, he would question, he would say, you're wrong, you're right. We did the interview, we did other things. And over time, uh, this uh, we met, we met personally when he came to Barcelona to uh, present the first volume of Your Face Tomorrow. And we met and a, a friendship developed. I became uh, ambassador of the kingdom of Redonda to uh, the Republic of Costa Guana, so two places that don't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I became Duke of the Kingdom of Redonda, <laughs> of which he was the king. So, uh, so, so this, is, this is how that, that first interview over facts became turned into, into a friendship that I'm very proud of. Uh, uh, he will be missed. Yeah, that's very beautiful. I remember um, he. I very much liked this way he had of kind of writing on anything that I sometimes he would send me a book of his, but the dedication would really be him continuing to talk to me so that there would be just a lot of questions and um, it wasn't like in any way the conventional sort of dedication of a book. It would have like a mini sort of paragraph attached to it, uh, which I always found beautiful. Um, I think, Margaret, would it be nice if, you know, if you were to read... A passage because I think it would be before we continue any further. I think it's important to give people an idea of the the sort of the uniqueness of the way he could write. Well, shall I, as you suggested, read that first page of All Souls? Absolutely. Paragraph, I should say. Yeah. Okay. Of the three, two have died since I left Oxford. 
and the superstitious thought occurs to me that they were perhaps just waiting for me to arrive and live out my time there in order to give me the chance to know them and now to speak about them. In other words, and this is equally superstitious, I may be under an obligation to speak about them. They did not die until after I had ceased to have anything to do with them. Had I continued to figure in their lives, to figure in their daily lives there, and stayed on in Oxford, perhaps they would not be dead. This thought is not only superstitious, it is also vain. But in order to speak of them, I must speak of myself and of my time in the city of Oxford, even though the person speaking is not the same person who was there. He seems to be, but he is not. If I call myself I, or use a name which has accompanied me since birth and by which some will remember me, if I detail facts that coincide with facts others would attribute to my life, or if I use the term my house for the house inhabited by others before and after me, but where I lived for two years, it is simply because I prefer to speak in the first person, and not because I believe that the faculty of memory alone is any guarantee that a person remains the same in different times and different places. The person recounting here and now what he saw and what happened to him then is not the same person who saw those things and to whom those things happened. Neither is he a prolongation of that person, his shadow, his heir, or his usurper. That is so happier. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if we could talk of, I mean, one of the things I think is amazing about his style is this kind of combination of high metafiction and mm. sort of lurid, almost B-movie kind of ways of writing. Um, so I love in this, uh, that opening of all souls, this kind of almost old fashioned use of suspense and kind of um, to lure the reader in. So, so he gives kind of so much pleasure, I think, because you can get it in so many different ways. Um, but um, Juan Gabriel, I mean, what do you kind of, how would you characterize the way he wrote? Well, I think that that first page of All Souls is crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, he had discovered there something that he had been exploring in previous books. Uh, the previous one was uh, a sentimental man. Co uh, correct my translations, Margaret. Yeah, yeah a, man, a man of feeling. It was translated. A man, a man, man of feeling. feeling. Yeah. Um, El hombre sentimental in Spanish. In, in which he begins to discover uh, certain possibilities of the first person, but it's not until All Souls that he really uh, goes into it, into uh, this this fashioning of a first person that strongly resembles him um, in in several senses, but uh, that allows him to to play with the limits of uh, of um, the identification between the character and the author. And he wrote a beautiful uh, piece in the 90s, I think, exploring that in which he says that what he did was just for this narrator, for the narrator of All Souls, was just give the narrator a couple of things that he didn't have in his own life, in his own life. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, a wife and a, and a child. And just with that small trick, he was able to, uh, to create... Uh, a fictional character that strongly resembled himself, that that fed of his own experiences, but that remained remained fiction, um, and uh, and and that transformed um, first person reflections, the thought of a human being, the the reflections on reflections, um, into literature suitable to be told mm -hmm. um, i think he was he was one of the great writers in recent years at this very difficult task of transforming thought into into fiction into into action of meditating on the page mm -hmm. um, he was a big admirer of henry james and Proust, mm -hmm. and it was in a sense because of this because of how they thought on the page um, where you you go through pages and pages of reflections on everyday life, uh, but they seem you seem to be witnessing something going on uh, instead of just uh, actionless thought. Um, I think this is one of the fascinating things about his first person that Margaret just illustrated with that 
with that first page of All Souls. Yeah, I think I love how many of his characters are these narrators, they're spies or ghostwriters or indeed translators. Um, uh, and in A Heart So White, I mean, you know, we were thinking there's this very famous scene of translation. Um, and I wonder if you could describe it because it's another of these interesting plays with kind of fictional reality. Yeah, he, um, in A Heart So White, um, there is a wonderful scene, which is one of the most famous of Javier Marias' uh, scenes in which two translators uh, meet in a room and one is working with for uh, a world leader, uh, a female, and the other one is working for a man. And the woman is the the world leader whose woman is assumed to be Margaret Thatcher. Um, I forget who the man is. Maybe uh, Juan Gabriel or Margaret. You could remind me. He's assumed to be the the president, the then prime minister of Spain. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, Felipe uh, Gonzalez. And they are waiting in the room, and and not much of anything is happening at all. Uh, and then um, they're both silent. They're obviously waiting for some negotiations to take on outside the room, right? And they are they're silent. Um, and then there is a moment where the male, uh, the man speaks, the male leader speaks, and his interpreter deliberately mistranslates what he says. Um, and shall I shall I read a bit of it? Yeah, I think, it so I think well. that would be great. I also just wanted to pick up on something that. Um, Juan Gabriel said, or maybe you said, Adam, about you know this idea of he does the, the rumination on the page. What what holds the reader so much is is that it is linked to some sort of noirish event. Yeah, and a lot of his books begin with somebody dying. Actually, uh, yeah. you know, they begin with with a murder or a death or or, or a suicide, and then the rumination begins and. Um, and I think that's what holds the readers who are not familiar with his work in at the beginning. But I'll read a, a, few, a couple, I'll read a, a page and a half, okay? I realized then that the 30 to 45 minutes we were to spend there, as if in the ante room of a tax inspector or a notary, might well be spent simply waiting for the time to pass and for the office boy or the servant to open the door for us again like a university porter announcing apathetically, time, or a nurse shouting out in a grating voice, next. I again turned around to Louisa, this time to say something under my breath. I think I was planning to mutter something like, what a drag, but I found that she was smiling back at me, her index finger firmly to her lips, which she tapped several times, indicating to me that I should remain silent. I know that I will never forget those smiling lips crossed by that index finger, which nevertheless failed to conceal her smile. I think it was at that moment, or more clearly at that moment, that I first thought it would be a good idea to get to know that woman, younger than me and extremely well shod. I think it was also the conjunction of her lips and her index finger her open lips and the index finger sealing them, her curved lips and the straight line of the index finger dividing them, that gave me the courage to abandon accuracy altogether when I translated the next question that our extremely high-ranking politician finally asked, once he'd removed from his pocket a heavy key ring loaded with keys, which he started jingling in the most unseemly manner. Would you like me to order some tea, he said. And I didn't translate. I mean that the English I put into his mouth was not his polite question, which must be which must be recognised was a, as trite as it was tardy. But this other question: Tell me, do the people in your country love you? I could feel Louisa's astonishment behind me. More than that, I noticed she immediately uncrossed her startled legs, the long legs that were never out of my sight, like the expensive new Prada shoes. She certainly knew how to spend her money unless someone else had given them to her. And for a few long seconds, I felt the back of my neck pierced by her sense of shock. I waited for her to intervene and denounce me, to correct or reprimand me, or rather for her, the net, to take over from me at once. That's what she was there for. 
But those few seconds passed, one, two, three, four, and she said nothing. Perhaps I thought then, because the high-ranking British politician didn't seem the least offended and replied at once with a kind of contained vehemence, I often wonder the same myself. <laughs> It's a wonderful scene, whereas it's full of it's full of comedy as well, isn't it? Um, and and one gets an, you know he manages to put a lot of information into it. I realised actually when I was reading it how hard it is to read because an awful lot of that is bracketed. There's a lot of bracketed information there as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, and 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 actually the scene is pages and pages and pages long. I've only read the, the the shortest segment, but it is a wonderful scene. And in this way, through this, a. a constant play and interplay of of, of, of words um, uh, and the way that they that they toy with the translation, sometimes misdirect, mistranslating, but also sometimes misdirecting the translation. Uh, they uh, He seduces, or at least he, um, he romances the woman who will later become his wife, the main character. Yeah, it's true. I think it's true. It's one of the problems both of this kind of talk and also I remember one, I, one time I tried to write an essay on Javier on a book that he'd written and realized that one of the problems is that you can't really quote because <laughs> the pleasure is in these such large structures and these kind of exorbitant like he does such strange things I think to proportion you know that um, an episode any other novelist would have kept to two sentences can become 25 pages in Javier. Well I mean so we should talk about that because it isn't it necessarily every other novelist it's every editor right? <laughs> you know i mean that you know, so you know i and i'd love to talk about his sentence lengths because as i was reading it i was thinking where's the full stop coming out <laughs> um yeah. i love his long sentences i really love them and when i first read javier marias i set about trying to write extremely long sentences myself to no great effect um mm -hmm. And I realized it was just not something that wasn't in my, you know, in my background, in my nature, training, whatever, mode of expression. Uh, but, you know, I made it an endeavor to try to write in these long sentences. But I also realized that, you know, I, I wouldn't, not only could I not put it off on the page, I wasn't going to be able to put it off with any Anglophile editor, any British editor or American editor that I was could think of. They were going to put in full stops, um, you know. And uh, uh, and and I and I wonder about that. And I wonder, in a way, you know, is he a very old-fashioned writer? And he had he, he obviously had a relationship with his editor where they had complete trust in him. But also, it tells me something else, which is about readers. That you know, maybe we are. Readers obviously love him. They love what he does. They love that the rumination that he has on the he, you know he does on the page. And you know maybe we're in a period where we should start thinking about that a bit more and, and step away from the sort of short sentence plot driven <laughs> uh, uh, novels that we seem that the market seems to be consumed by. I'll um I, I'll let you say talk to the others, but I I I, I did in preparation for this and thinking about the sentence length, have a look at, I'd never read any any reviews of Javier Marias's work, I'd only ever read the work itself. And, um, but I, anyway, when I was sort of, you know, swatting for this talk, I had a look at some of the reviews and, you know, every single time an American or a British uh, uh, a reviewer says something like, what went wrong? The problem is simple. Thus bad begins, it's far too long. And then highly circuitous narrative appears to meander nearly lackadaisically at time. And then again, um, long, long run on sentences become tiresome. So, you know, the, the, it seems to me that the, the critics and the readers are at odds with each other. Right. You know, the critics are picking up on this thing because, as we've alluded to a couple of times, stylistically, we are in an, in an era of very short sentences. And yet, actually, uh, readers love him. Yeah. And love the long sentences. I love the idea this is going to become a manifesto for the very long sentence. Um, <laughs> uh, Margaret, I, actually, I'm quite interested also just to think about translating these sentences, because one of the things also that does strike me um, is it's I think it's an interesting position you're in that you basically translated nearly all of what he wrote from. Yeah, yes, I think just two books I didn't translate. And um, 
and I'm kind of interested in discussing that partly because I think his style did become more and more Baroque actually, you know, that I recently was picking up on Your Face Tomorrow. And I think if you compare the sentences there to even to All Souls, they yeah. seem even more kind of complicated and with more and more parentheses. And I was just wondering kind of, do, is, is there any way in which you're conscious of having to sort of match this development of style or do you think it, it does it just happen very pragmatically? I don't know. I mean, I didn't, I mean, the books get longer. So maybe that's because the sentences get longer too. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really, I didn't really notice it when I was translating, but unfortunately, um, like Javier, I, I love Henry James and Proust. So for me, the long sentence is just ideal. I just love it because people often say, well, English isn't made for long sentences, but which is utter nonsense. Yeah, it's not true. You know, as long as you've got enough that's interesting to say, which Javier had. I mean, I think, and because he's not bothered about plot particularly. I mean, occasionally something happens in the novel, but it doesn't. That isn't what drives him. He's interested in the ideas, in what's going on in, on the narrator's head, what's happening in other people, and just an idea. He just likes to follow an idea right through, and just and a friend of mine who loves him too. Uh, he said he's he's the main the words that occur again and again are perhaps and maybe. <laughs> this is always there's always a perhaps. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to be, I mean, an inspire. I mean, interested like because I think often you know we're talking here about the kind of the tradition of the English sentence, but what about in Spanish? Like, what? How unusual are these sentences in Spanish? Are they more usual, less usual? I think they're more usual. I think the language probably lends itself to to this kind of of sentence more easily. But the weird thing for me um, is that I think my personal theory is that Javier got it from the English language. Mm. He learned he learned to do uh, this kind of sentence when he was maybe twenty seven or twenty eight uh, and translated Tristan Shandy. Mm. Uh, and that translation won uh, a translation press in Spain. It was um, it was praised uh, all over Spain, and I think this this is one of the places where he learned two things that are very important for uh, for his work. One is the length of sentences, um, uh, and the other is the power of digression. His mm. novels are full of digressions um there's a scene that i love in your face tomorrow in which two characters meet at this london uh lavatory uh they're in, in in these restrooms and one of them takes out a sword a kind of renaissance sword what it maybe i can't i can't rem remember um and raises the sword and is about to to let it fall on the other guy. Mm. And at that point, there are maybe 20 pages of digressions about swords and weapons and fear, uh, yeah. the power you have over somebody else when you have a weapon and the reasons you would have to feel a certain kind of fear and not some other kind of fear. Um, and 20 pages go by. Yeah. And it's... Uh, uh, and it, he, I think the value of that and the and the idea that this can be a way of doing literature comes from Tristam Shandy and the whole idea that I progress as I digress, um, that Lawrence Stern mm. discussed so, so many times. Um, so he, he, I, I think he did one of the most difficult things you can do as a novelist, which is he created his own writer his own reader, I mean. He created a reader that liked Javier Marias. And this is why sometimes critics are at odds with, with readers, uh, but the readers are there and they're willing to forgive any kind of length and digressions of any kind of length because they're in the hands of somebody they know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is, I think this is what you should keep in mind. Yeah, it's very, I think I feel there's two directions I wanna go. I think just, I want to think about this kind of idea of the lurid and the noir and um you know i was laughing to myself when i was rereading um your face tomorrow that he can do this thing where the tiniest bit of plot will happen clearly when after about 30 pages he feels you know like so there's this very funny moment i think where 
at least 100 pages it seems to take place with you know one person at the beginning of the novel um, going to an Oxford party and then going upstairs takes about another 30 pages to kind of go and get a book um, okay. and and what I love is that just when maybe he's thinking that this is kind of exhausted, also he's like the character sees a drop of blood on the stairs oh, yeah. and I feel this is kind of emblematic of what Javier does so it's just like it comes out of nowhere it's never really explained I think or kind of but it's this perfect thing almost out of an Agatha Christie or something it looks like a clue mm. and you're never quite sure how much of a clue it is but it's enough there for the reader that you're sort of there processing then that kind of apparent plot while the kind of amazing cadenzas of thinking kind of happen um and i feel though that we shouldn't forget that i in many ways these books do very deeply engage with spanish history and politics you know and i feel um I wonder if Hank Granby, you could talk a little about, you know, the way in which these novels do interrogate, especially the kind of aftermath of the Civil War um, yeah. and the kind of fascist kind of communist kind of struggle, because I think that it's clearly important to him personally, given what happened with his father. Um, mm -hmm. And also just that they do actually add up to this amazing fresco of kind of Spanish kind of politics. Yeah, yeah. Well, um you know there there is a corner that he that he turned um uh with the new century something happened that i I'm, I'm not able to to really point at but um you don't get spanish history in a heart so white you don't get any kind of spanish history in all souls or uh, tomorrow in the battle think of me um but then something happens at the turn of the century and he starts writing your face tomorrow in which Spanish history for the first time has a very uh, preeminent, takes a very preeminent space in, in the book. And the book is among many other things. Every book by Javier Marias is about many things at the same time. But this one is about many other things, the Spanish Civil War. Um, turning around this anecdote in which his father was betrayed by a friend uh, denounced or informed on, and um, and this is how uh, he lost his job, and he had the the real character behind this this uh, fictional character had to leave uh, Spain and go to work in the U.S. Um, but this is the first time he exploits Spanish history or explore or uses the novel to explore Spanish history, and this is very eloquent of what his relationship with the country was. You have to remember, he started writing about everything except Spain. He published his first novel when he was 19, um, the second one maybe a couple of years later. And these first attempts were never even close to Spain. They were like, like pastiches of um, English language fiction that he loved, adventure novels um, that he loved. Uh, and he was accused and he brought that as often he brought that up as often as he could, he was accused of writing bad translations of English fiction, um, which he was very proud of. He was very proud of his <laughs> Anglophilia uh, um, and um, and of aping, in a sense, uh, the British writers, the English language writers that he loved. But then slowly he became closer and closer to Spain and Madrid appears uh, in, in A Heart So White, uh, the city, but not Spanish history as a background. And it's only many years later with Your Face Tomorrow that he's able to reflect on uh, history and politics um, and the impact of history and politics in the life of an individual in Your Face Tomorrow. So it was a long time coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I love this idea. I wonder, you know, it seems so interesting, this way in which he is a kind of anglicized Spanish like it's as if he kind of exists nowhere um which I think is very beautiful that there's this sort of um I mean I'm thinking actually you know you should say that even, a lot of these titles are actually taken you know from Shakespeare or for, you know that um they're essentially English titles um and um I just I, just to go back to the translation just one last time maybe Margaret like kind of were there any particular problems, which, I mean, not just say on the sentence level, but are, are there, was there anything specific to the way Javier wrote that was, 
an unusually difficult thing for you as a translator compared to other writers or well no i mean he often talks about in in the spanish original he often talks about words in spanish and the origin of those words in spanish so in a way that could be problematic but it, it wasn't really you know yeah. can i can i just go back to what juan gabriel was saying about your face tomorrow um he did say to me that he he wanted to write that book about the Spanish Civil War because of his father, and because his father was then in his nineties, I think. And could you I th maybe, yeah? Could you explain a bit more about his father? Because I think that's quite important. Well, his father was a, a very great philosopher, um, and he he had to spend some of his time in exile in America, but mainly he he still lived in in Madrid with his family, but it, it was that betrayal. I mean, betrayal is a big theme in Javier in all his novels, I think, betrayals and lies and things. And I think he wanted to put his father's story on paper and give his side of the story. And, you know, his his horror at what had happened, really. Mm. He loved his father very dearly, and, and he was a great man, I think. Yeah. And honestly, it's it's also, also, sorry. I'm sorry, I was just going to add that it's useful to know that his father was alive when he wrote the first volume. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and so he he died while Javier was in the middle of the writing of the whole novel, yeah. uh, and that strongly that had a strong impact on not only the development of the novel but also his own his own private relationship to the writing that he was that he was doing. It yeah. it, it it gains, I think, an emotional consistency um, that has to deal with the fact that uh, it is a way also it is a, in a sense also a kind of letter to his father um, so that's that's helpful to know I would be interested to know um, <clears throat> having lived under a dictatorship uh, that there is a by necessity a massive degree of self-censorship that occurs um, and I would be interested to know in the context of the rest of Spanish literature, you know, it it, it seems to me that, that when a culture is emerging from the, those sorts of political circumstances, it does take quite a lot of time for the self-censorship to lift of the people who have most closely experienced that um, that condition. And somewhere like having somebody like um, Javier Marias, who... who whose family was affected by it would, I think, have a very particularly close relationship with or, or struggle with self-censorship. I don't know. But I, I would be interested to know how he fits with the rest of Spanish literature. You know, how many other writers were directly confronting the Spanish Civil War and at what point? Yeah, that's one for you. <laughs> um, well, um... He was he, he made it a, a point to to be different from his generation in that sense, um, in a in a way to to flee what was expected of him as a Spanish young novelist. This is why his his first novels are set in other places and and uh, um, and their characters are English people. Um, he his way of dealing with the political life of the place he started publishing in in 1971 was rejection or or uh, uh, pretending it, it's it's not there mm -hmm. um his his he didn't have a good relationship with the spanish literature of the 20th century uh, he rarely mentions any writers that he cared about um, in in spanish literature in the 20th century uh, a meaning before the time he started publishing. Um, whereas for him, Conrad was a sort of personal god and mm -hmm. Faulkner and Nabokov were very important for him. Um, as a translation, this was also apparent. He translated um, The Mirror of the Sea. Uh, anyway, he, uh, his very tense relationship with the political moment in which he began publishing manifested itself in terms of uh almost not acknowledging that this was that this was going on mm -hmm. um it was it was many years later when he started 
a kind of reconciliation, I think, mm. with Spanish culture. And I think this has a lot to do uh, with what he felt the country that is the dictatorship had done to his father. Mm. Um, it's interesting because when you look at books that uh, are not directly about the about Spain and, and Franco and the dictatorship, and if you... If you, I'm thinking of Tomorrow in the Battle, Think of Me, uh, for example, or Thus Bad Begins. It, it, p- people are stuck in a marriage and they are betraying each other within the marriage. But the marriage itself is circumscribed by what's going on outside, which is that, that divorce is illegal in Spain until 1980. So actually they are living within the conditions of society and they're betraying each other. So in a way, the, the marriage is the microcosm of the, of the wider society. Yeah, I think what's so beautiful about these novels is to think whether he's direct, you know, that there's, it's not that the, as it were, kind of the novels of desire or of kind of relationships are less or more political than the ones that seem to directly address it. It seems to me like, Margaret, what you were saying is true, that they have this constant production of themes on the kind of you know of betrayal Mm -hmm. and of I think also of sort of like you say about perhaps and maybe of the impossibility of truly knowing something you know or the problems of how you know something like there's another of the books I really love by him is the book he kind of wrote about all souls um Mm -hmm. dark back of time where partly you know he called it like a false novel I mean it clearly is a novel as well but it kind of isn't at the same time and in that, he kind of says, this is the only book where I am now kind of just talking about as myself. But, of course, everyone knows that there is no such thing as t- testimony, that there is no possibility of actually telling the truth about anything in a kind of comprehensive way. Um, and I feel that, you know, within that novel, which is kind of full of the imaginary kingdom of Redondo and the, the sort of um, seemingly total playfulness, but actually you can then see obvious similarities both with the later novels about the Civil War, um, or something like The Infatuations, which is about kind of not understand, you know, seeing two people in a cafe day after day, and then not knowing when someone gets murdered, you know, what the true story is, and trying to find it out. Um, yeah. Well, I think, but then that sort of leads us back to this, uh, the sort of noirish element in him, because I think there is a, a sort of Hitchcockian element a lot of the, in a lot of the, yeah. the, the stories. Which which is extraordinary in a in a novel. His novels are so intellectual, in a way. But then there is this strange dark plot going on behind it all. And yes. as as Aminata was saying, you know, it often begins with a death. I yeah. mean, I think some of his opening lines are just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I did write down a couple actually. Um, yes, I was brought up the old fashioned way. I could never have dreamed that I would one day be ordered to kill a woman. <laughs> and, you know, you think that's my God, what's going to happen here? You know, so although he's sort of he's kind of anti-plot in some way, but at the same time there is a plot. He always said he didn't write, well, he didn't never knew how his books were going to end or what was going to happen. But do you think that was true? I have to believe him. He said that. I can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe it. Um, in, uh, in, in tomorrow, uh, um, in the battle, think of me. Mm. I'm right. That's the one that begins with the woman who dies. Well, the she's in she's in bed with a man who was not her husband yeah. in her house. And the it the, there are two chapters, mm. and it begins with the fact of her death. But then it actually, you know, he backtracks and it takes two chapters for her to actually die. While we go on these ruminations and excursions of thought on the part of the man that she is with. Uh, And then um, there's a child who enters the room at one point and the man has to deal with the child. Uh, uh, But then after she has died, which, as I say, you know, takes a couple of chapters, and she's not died of anything. We don't know what she's died of, but it's some unknown illness and it takes her reasonably quickly. But then he's in the he's in the, the the would have been would be lover is in the kitchen and another man telephones and he hears the he hears the voice on the answering machine and the other man is saying where are you what are you doing why aren't you picking up your husband's out of town we could have met 
<laughs> how, how come you didn't call me? And that then brings in another element of my good, what, what is going on here? And it takes the rest of the book to untangle, but it does untangle in, in, in a very unexpected way. I mean, the ending is quite unexpected of that book. So I can believe he didn't know where it was going to go. I can believe he knew how it was going to begin, but not necessarily where it was going to go, because he, he invents the characters and then leaves it up to them to figure it out. And then, and, and in that, in that, in uh, when, while she is dying and after she has died, the character is looking at the numerous choices he has, right? Should he call her husband? Should he do this? Should he do that? Should he cover her up? What should he do with the child? You know, so he's he's running through all of these possibilities, and I can see that that's something you could you could choose to figure out on the page and and leave it to your character to decide. Yeah. Well, one of the things he was more adamant about was the fact that he didn't correct his novels mm. as he was moving forward. He he used to say that he would correct a single page until he thought that it could no longer, that he wasn't able to make it any better. And this is when he went to the next page. But he never, he never went back in his own novel to correct something that he had already written. He said he tried to write following the same principles uh, as in life. We don't go through life being able to go back to the past and edit what we have lived through or correct our mistakes. And so he, he, he used to say that he discovered the novel as he was writing it, but never, never went back to, to modify anything um, based on the discoveries that he was making. Uh, and weirdly for me, this has a lot to do with his, with his, with the practical methods because he didn't use a computer. He he wrote on a typewriter until the, the end of his life, um, and, uh, and and this idea of of a a final page coming out from a typewriter and being as final as you can get, um, and uh, prohibiting himself from going back to change or edit or move things around as you're able to do with a computer this is this is something that has to do with 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 how he uh thought of uh fiction um he he loved the idea in henry fielding that that um the the, the latin root of invention is, means discovery mm -hmm. i think it's it's what he explained one one day to me um so to invent is to discover what was already there um, but you go, you go in into your material um, as an explorer, uh, and you're not able to go back to correct anything or, or or change anything. You 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 use what you find. Yeah. Yeah, it's very beautiful because I think one that's sort of there are so many paradoxes with Harry. You know, you have this incredibly intellectual author who is actually very brilliant on writing about kind of B movies and westerns. Mm -hmm. um, and you have this seemingly incredibly sort of artificial is the wrong word, but someone such a stylist, and yet with this headlong improvised kind of nature to the writing, which I think is um, amazing. I was just thinking we should probably talk about his last book as well, Thomas Nevinson. I was wondering, Margaret, could you give us a quick kind of idea of that novel? Because also I always find it kind of sad, I think, with novels that become last works, but, you know, not meant as last works, as it were. Um, and I think it would just be, you know, nice to try to mention it. Well, I mean, Thomas Nevinson, he, Thomas Nevinson is a character in the previous novel, Betha Isla. He's yes. the husband of Betha Isla. And he's been working as an undercover agent. And he's just, he's finally retired from being an undercover agent. And he's completely spent and wasted. It's almost as if he doesn't know who he is anymore. And I just, I found that very moving, the idea that if you've been pretending to be other people most of your life, what that must do to you as a person. Yeah. And at the end, he, he, I think in the novel, he rediscovers his humanity, which is it's yeah. almost a happy ending, which is <laughs> quite <Yeah. unusual. laughs> It's true. One thing, I, you know, people often, you know, I feel some novelists are very fond of trying to kind of argue that their works form some kind of giant single work. And actually with Javier, I think there's some truth in it, partly because of this way in which mm -hmm. characters kind of recur, um, you know, in a reused, so, so a minor character might develop a kind of larger 
space or indeed he'll then say i once referred to this person under this name but in fact i can now reveal they are this name in a different novel mm -hmm. um i think there's something very beautiful about it this kind of sense of sort of constant generation um and a play between the fictional and the real as well in this kind of i don't know it's just um yeah you definitely felt that javier could have carried on forever <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes. um, I wish. Uh, I um, So before we go, I just have to ask the Duke of Redonda here, who yeah. mentioned it casually in his introduction, that he had a dukedom. Have you ever visited it? No, of course not. It's just a, uh, it's just a, a, a it's big a rock. It's a big rock in the middle of the Caribbean um, <laughs> with birds on it. <laughs> uh, I heard heard recently of a a big fan of Maria's who traveled all the way there, um, left his boat nearby and I and went swimming to the very small island of Redonda. Um, he came back to the boat, back to Spain, and he was just. Uh, uh, excited at the possibility of telling the story to Javier Marias when he met him. Um, and this is when he fell ill and died and he could never talk to Javier and tell him this beautiful story. Oh. Sad. Yeah. It's incredibly sad. Maybe we should finish on that incredibly sad and poignant. Um, <laughs> yes, very poignant story. Thank you for that, Juan Gabriel. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think there's something... I was thinking partly also of his originality, you know, like I remember um, I found this passage, I think it's in um, an essay on Lampedusa, uh, where he basically says that there's no such thing. He basically argues against the idea of progress in literature or the idea that you can never do anything new. And he says, um, old and new texts breathe in unison, so much so that one wonders sometimes if everything that has ever been written is not simply the same drop of water falling on the same stone, and if perhaps the only thing that really changes is the language of each age. Um, and, uh, but I think for me, you know, he really was original and I think that really did do something new uh, in the history of literature. Um, and so I think everyone should read him. Yes, definitely. I concur. <laughs> Excellent. Well, on that note of agreement to try and balance out Juan Gabriel's um, <laughs> desperately sad <laughs> story. Um, I appreciate it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>